With a major work project coming up in mid-August that would keep me away from the boat for almost five weeks, I had to scramble to find some sort of insurance and a place to take Nina for a haul out. Despite many frustrations, the pieces fell into place one by one. Except for a crew. I had almost no experience with any kind of boat, and I didn't dare attempt to move Nina on my own. I know a few experienced boaters and sailors in the area. One was unavailable, one never called me back, and one asked way too many questions. I was hoping to avoid hiring a professional captain and was pretty sure I'd have a hard time finding one in time anyway. With about a week to go, I remembered that I'd been lurking for a while on an online sailing forum and it dawned on me that if I joined and posted a request for help, some qualified person in the area might come forward. It turned out that was a pretty good idea. An experienced young sailor and yacht owner named Paul responded immediately and he and his wife Grace came over to look at Nina on the last Saturday before my deadline. They were both charmed by her, and we all got along pretty well, but Paul said he couldn't go with me on a weekday. This was discouraging, because I did not want to make this uncertain voyage on a Sunday in midsummer on that stretch of the intracoastal waterway. I'd seen and heard too many bad things about clueless and reckless boaters, and just the volume of the traffic could be a problem. For when Paul suddenly said, well, if you want, I can go with you tomorrow. I guess all it took was for him to mention the idea because I quickly decided to suck it up and just go for it. But there was another snag. I didn't have an actual appointment for a haul out or for storage, and the yard I'd spoken to was closed for the weekend. But I didn't panic because Nina had come with some special magic. Back when I'd been calling boat yards, I had a conversation with the owner of this one, Bill, who had told me that he not only knew this boat from the late 80s, but her former owner, Dayton, was an old friend of his. And miraculously, Dayton and his first mate, Ingrid, were at that very yard that week, having come up from Maryland to haul out their boat. I didn't have contact info for Dayton or Ingrid, so I drove down there after meeting with Paul and luckily found them on their boat. I explained the situation, Ingrid called Bill at home, and the next thing you know, I had a slip ready for my boat and two dock hands to catch my lines when we arrived the next day. I rushed back to Point Pleasant finished making hurried preparations, and spent one last night aboard Nina at her old home. Paul showed up the next morning on time. The weather looked perfect, and the boat was as ready to go as she would ever be. All that remained was to successfully motor this old girl about 13 miles. So far, I've been pretty lucky with Nina, and as I guided her out into the canal on her first outing in about 10 years, I hoped that luck would hold, at least until I got her safely on the hard. How do you like that?
This is Paul, by the way. He is a legend. Not many people would embark on such a mission with someone they'd only met the day before after just a brief look at some old boat. Now, I took a chance on him too, but I was desperate. He wasn't. Of course, from now on, he will be on the A-list for future crew. He, his family, and friends will be welcome aboard my boat any time. Yeah, my, my better acquaintances, they let me down because they're, they're cowards. This is what they are, they're cowards. They're afraid. Afraid to take a chance on an old boat and a crazy old man. But uh, yeah, we're doing just, just fine. Conditions were almost perfect, with calm water and a light, slowly building breeze out of the south-southwest. I had set up an ad hoc sail rig, mostly in case the engine quit, but we didn't touch the sails even when it looked tempting. We got waked by a few bennies, but it wasn't as bad as I'd expected. Nina handled herself in a very ladylike fashion, and with a new jerry can and some fresh fuel, the tiny Beta Marine 16 diesel happily kept us going at four knots at about half power. I had to circle a few times to wait for two different bridges to open for us, but it was no big deal, even though I was waiting for something awful to happen at the worst possible time. Paul proved very useful, getting things ready for docking, helping with navigation, and going below periodically to check temperatures of the engine and shaft. The engine didn't falter, the dripless seal didn't blow, the rotten tiller didn't break, and Nina's tired old bottom didn't seem to mind moving through the water again. <laughs> Alright, yeah. Captain Son, what are we doing? We're waiting for them to open the uh, Route 37 Bridge, or whatever it's called. Route 37 Mattis Bridge. We just opened it about five minutes ago, and we were too slow, so now we gotta wait another 20 minutes to get our to get our passes through. The first bridge is 60 feet, but the second one's only 30, so. I was sleep deprived, emotionally frazzled, and uh, yeah, oh yeah, I'd never done anything like this before, but it was quite a thrill. We made our way into the Toms River after almost four hours on the bay, and I gingerly, if clumsily, guided Nina through the mooring field and into the slip with about five knots of wind on her starboard beam as we arrived. Dayton and Ingrid were there to help get us secured, and other than snagging one of those damn cat heads on a piling, it went pretty well, I think. And just like that, it was done. I almost couldn't believe it. Despite my inexperience and rash decisions, I'd gotten myself a nice sailboat and brought her without incident to a premium classic boat repair shop where, incredibly, she had old friends and her former master from decades earlier waiting to greet her. Maybe I'm just a fool, but sometimes it seems that foolishness, especially when inspired by beauty and dreams of adventure, can get the attention of the gods and compel them to shower a fool with good fortune. Mm. I didn't do a whole lot the rest of that afternoon. I was exhausted. I went to bed early and slept like a baby aboard Nina, just like I always do. I was greeted the next morning by a wonderful sunrise. And Nina, doing just fine, her bilge pump not going off any more than before. Her neighbor, however, well, I'm 
I'm sure they'll get it figured out. In another day or so, I'd have to steer Nina into this slip so she could be hauled out, brought into the yard. This is the kind of stuff they do here. I don't think Nina's going to need quite this much work, but I'm going to leave this sort of thing to the pros here. And I'm sure they'll do a great job. There are a lot of cool boats here. Look at this little cat boat. Beautiful. It is surreal to see Nina here, finally. She is safe and sound. Finally got a good look at the bowsprit. Now let me try to explain about Dayton and his Australian first mate, Ingrid, who've been sailing this fabulous wooden scow schooner up and down the East Coast for a long time. She's based in Baltimore, and her name is Nina. Dayton named her after his mother. He bought her when he still owned my boat, which he had also named after his mother. He was happy to see her, and full of good advice, and a few good stories. We might uh, see more of them later. I'm still working on that. But anyway, they've become friends. I like it here. There's a lot going on, a lot of interesting projects. I'll show you some of that later. The yard's practically empty now, but as the season winds down, a lot of boats are going to be coming out for winter storage. At this point, I only had an arrangement month to month for storage, but it would soon become apparent that Nina was going to be there at least all winter, which was fun. There's plenty of stuff I was planning on doing later that I may as well do now while I'm waiting for them to have time to take a look at her hull. Yeah, you'll see about that in the next episode.